Yeah, thank you both for these, um, to use a religious term, inspiring uh, lectures. And Marka more than made up for Canon's acrophobia by bombarding us with uh, all kinds of uh, more or less obscene images. Um, I'm mainly referring to Crazy Frog, of course. Can I send you uh, my therapist's invoice? Uh, but, um, right. Um, so, um, one really um, important motive, I think, um, during all talks uh, was um, the dialectic of uh, secularization and of uh, religion as secularization or secularized religion, and conversely, um, uh, the secular that itself um, comes to be uh, synchronized uh, to some uh, degree, whether it's uh, seemingly secular notions like nature or progress or humankind, um, um, or more specific um, uh, motives in discourse, but um, this notion of contemporary religion really being uh, highly secularized, um, not being that religious at all, um, I'm wondering, so where does that leave uh, this notion of the return of religion as a myth? I cannot help feeling that you can use the term myth uh, more or less in um, a way in which we all use it often in daily life. Uh, when we think of myth or when we use the term myth as more or less being more or less synonymous with an illusion or a lie, you have the TV show Mythbusters in which you know a group of people trying to bust or confirm myths and by myths they mean misconceptions, urban legends, etc. Um, is that how you use the term and shouldn't we also use the term myth um, as something that's to use a popular uh, fashionable term more performative as something that um, you know can to, to a certain extent create and shape social and cultural reality just as nationalist myths did in the 19th century so in other words does this myth of the return of religion not um, indeed have a huge impact and how, how would you uh, characterize that impact, if you, if you would. Well, as you yourself suggested well, when you were talking, the, the term myth can be used in a number of different ways, um, all of which have validity. Um, I, was, I was trying, in a sense, the title was being provocative, of course, uh, but it was also making the point that we too easily accept the idea that what we're seeing is a resurgence of traditional religion in its uh, uh, religious forms, in, in its traditional form. The, the, the key point I'm trying to make is that insofar as, as, as we see a growth in spirituality and, and, and religious forms, they're very different <coughs> from traditional forms of religion. There's, there's a tendency to lump everything together and talk about the return of religion. And what I'm trying to do is kind of separate the two out and say the forms of religions religiosity we see today are very different from traditional forms of religion religiosity. They have something in common with contemporary forms of secular uh, politics. Uh, but, those sec but many of those forms of secular politics are very different from traditional forms of secular politics. And it's, it's, it's said that the, the cleavage I'm, I'm, I'm trying to draw is not between the secular and the religious, even though I am uh, uh, a secularist. The, the cleavage I'm trying to draw is, is, is a historical one and say that something has changed over the last 20 years which has made both secular and religious ideologies uh, different today than they were in the past. And what I'm trying to draw out is, to, is, is trying to understand what has changed in, in the past 15-20 years and to relate that both to changes in secular, in secular politics and, to, and, and changes in religious politics. You've said um, uh, quite um, succinctly that um, religion has always involved um, a mediation, or in other terms, uh, in terms that you wouldn't use, a dialectic between the profane and the sacred. Um, isn't isn't it um, isn't it precisely this relation that has changed? I think traditionally it was quite a complex process of mediation. You had the profane and you had the sacred, and um, you know to what degree can we? apply our notions about the sacred in daily life, to what, to what degree can we actually submit, subject daily life, profane life, to uh, the sacred. It seems to me that there, this is 
where there's a real change. You yourself mentioned um, American fundamentalist creationists who take the biblical text, Genesis, extreme, you know, extremely literally, and with, with this they regress, if you can call it that, to a state that actually goes way back, you know, they, Saint, Saint Augustine had a more sophisticated notion of, of um, um, uh, how to treat this text, you know, in a non-literal way, in a metaphorical way, allegorical way, than these people. So, an extremely literal interpretation of a sacred text leads to dramatic consequences for, um, for daily life, for seemingly profane matters. It seems to me that here this process of mediation, of translation between the profane and the sacred changes and that indeed translation to a certain extent is replaced by literal application. Does that make sense? Well, the, the point is that a literal <coughs> reading of a text is a very modern phenomenon. Um, it, there's a tendency to see literal readings as something traditional, something that goes back to um, In Christianity, you can see it as, 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 as the, the product of, of Protestant. Um, as the individualization of, 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 of faith and of, uh, of faith as an individual relationship between uh, 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 the believer and God. And, and, and in a sense, what I'm suggesting is that what's happened today is that that process has been taken uh, to, to its logical conclusion, as it were, because the relationship between the individual and the traditional communities of religion, of community of faith, have become a uh, 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 Seven, and in that sense, that the, the, the relationship that the individual has with, uh, with with his or her faith is through the literal reading of the text, and with through rigid social uh, and, 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 and cultural and, and religious forms. The point um, it, it's interesting that the, the, the you know the um, jihadist suicide videos, because what strikes you in every single one, and I've seen lots of them, is the narcissism, the sheer narcissism of, the, of those videos. There is a, 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 and that's what strikes you about contemporary terrorism compared to previous forms. Um, uh, there's um, uh, Fajr Benson, the, the, the American sociologist, um, in his book, The Landscapes of, of Jihad. He makes the point that what has changed is what he calls the relationship between cause and effect. In other words, in the past, if you took an organisation um, that uh, engaged in terrorist activity, whether the PLO or the IRA. Uh, the point was that um, there was always a relationship between cause and effect. Those organisations had a political cause. Their activities, whatever you think of them, were part of a, a further that political cause. Uh, there was always a relationship between the individual uh, and the action he or, 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 uh, he or she took and that political cause. You take something, an, an organisation such as the IRA. For the IRA, um, not anybody could become a member. Uh, that membership, you had to uh, become a member because you accepted the cause, you accepted the discipline of the leadership of the IRA, just like, um, uh, as it was with the PLO, as it was with most uh, terrorist groups of, of the past. Um, and there was a relationship there between cause and effect. That no longer happens. There is no relationship between cause and effect in the sense that there is no political cause to which uh, terror is a response. Terror is a, is a response, is, is, is an action in and of itself. People don't become jihadists because they're chosen to become jihadists, but because it is part of their personal journey to God. In other words, the whole relationship between political cause and political action has completely changed. And it is in that context, and it's become much more narcissistic, and it is, it is in that context, I think, we need to understand both things like contemporary terror and things like contemporary forms of religion. That's what's changed, I think, over the past uh, 10, 20, 30 years. Mm, yeah, so one interesting aspect of today, I think, is that we come to see how closely related forms of, let's say, New Age religion and spirituality spirituality really are to what is seeming, you know, what is seemingly the opposite fundamentalism. Um, we see some deep structural Absolutely. Uh, uh, again, yeah. the, the, the yeah. point is that this is not a throwback to the past, but a very new contemporary form of those religions, which have, um, uh, as I said, uh, you know, you can't, a literal reading of the book and a fundamentalist reading of religion cannot take place outside of a, a scientifically literate uh, uh, culture. I'm, 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 this is not an argument against a scientific literal 
culture. I'm saying that it is only in that context that those forms of faith make sense because they're responding to, 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 the, to the gains and importance of science. It's important I'm talking about, about, about intelligent design. Intelligent design would make absolute, would have, you know, a, a, a 15th century uh, a Catholic would not make sense of intelligent design because the idea that, that, um, that one should empirically show the work of God in, 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 would, 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 that, that one has to have a scientific proof of the work of God, which, 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 is, which is underlies uh, intelligent design, um, would, it, would it be nonsensical to them because they would have taken their religion in a metaphorical, allegorical way, not in a literal way. Um, yeah, well, because I, I want to say, because I understand what you're saying, but I think you're, you're making too much of a distinction between present and past, or, or this notion of traditional as, as kind of this set and established thing that's been around for a long time, in the sense that, I mean, if you look at the night fundamentalism emerging in the 1920s, so fundamentalism has a long, long history already, relatively, by American standards. Um, but at the same time, you know, whether you're looking at the 19th century and the, the influence of Eastern spirituality on the development of theosophy, uh, if you're looking at all kinds of religious developments in the United States and in Europe, or the history that I was telling about the ways you have the, the um, growth of a new orthodox movement in the late 19th century, so continually through modern history, what you see is that religions are transforming themselves and religious communities are transforming themselves and their practices. And that this always goes in interrelation with the society around them and with the kinds of conventions of argument, the con conventions of discourse, the conventions of proof that happen to be dominant at that particular moment. So, Yes, what's happening now is new, but it's not a radical break because it's new, because in each generation we've seen all sorts of newness, right? So for example, Gandhi was making use of Tolstoy and Ruskin and was developing a very different reading of Hinduism uh, than what had been established as the classical reading of Hinduism by the British before him. Um, so there's you know, a continual morphing going on. Um, and I don't, it's not clear to me why the morphing that's going on now is, you know, I don't know, I mean, how do you measure egotism? Um, you know, I, I mean, look at the, I had also here a picture of Hirsch and of Jeff Koons and so forth, you know, tremendous egotism all over the place. I mean, this is, you know, the, the I mean, modernity is, is the sacralization of egotism. Um, so I don't, you know, so it's not quite clear to me, and then, you know, just how do you pinpoint that it's more egotistical now, or um, that it's more disconnected, or, you know, all those sorts of things that you're arguing. Well, first thing is that to say that something is news is not, is not to say, is not to deny that religions have always changed. Clearly religions have always changed and made themselves anew. And, and, and so I'm not suggesting that religion stay in a static form uh, between uh, in, in a, uh, the, the founding of Islam in, 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 in the um, 7th century and today. Clearly Islam completely changed and transformed itself and, and part of it, the myth of fundamentalism is that, it's a, is, is that, that that corrupted Islam and that there's a need to return to the original pure Christine forms of Islam. Um, so to say that there is something fundamentally distinct about um, contemporary forms of religiosity is not to deny that religion changes. But those changes took place within certain uh, political, historical, social, institutional contexts. And it is that context, I think, which has changed. It is that, um, that there was always a, a relationship between the individual, and, and this is true not just of, uh, this is true of, of most of the great faiths, a relationship between the individual, the society into which that individual uh, was, was born, the institutions which bound that society uh, and gave faith its meaning, and so on. And it is, it, it is, it, 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 it was, it, that, that was the, which is why religion, which is a problem that the atheists always make, which is say, which is think about religion as simply a set of beliefs. Religion isn't a set of, simply a set of beliefs. It is a set of beliefs in a particular social, historical, institutional context. 
And it's that social and historical institutional context that, 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 that has changed. And it has changed in this fashion. See, you're right that uh, fundamentalism has, has, has a relatively long history. Um, you can go back beyond the 1920s. I mean, uh, as I said, uh, the, 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 the root of uh, in Christianity, the root of the literary reading of the book, is with Protestantism. Uh, Protestantism and the, uh, creating that, that the idea of the, 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 the relation between the individual and, and, and God, and the idea of the, of, of the individual's own God. Then, ways in, in one sense, the, 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 uh, begins the road to, to, a, to a fundamentalist view and then a completely narcissistic view of that relationship between the individual and God. Um, uh, and, and so in that sense, there, there, there is a, you know, you, you can go back to um, the, the origins of Protestants, and you can go back to the origins of, of, of fundamentalism in America in, 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 in the late 19th, early 20th century, and so on. But the, but the point is, all those Protestantism um, develop within a, within a framework, um, a, a social historical cultural framework, and created an institutional framework for its, its, its uh, 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 social expression. If you, look, if you talk to jihadists today, if you talk to radical Islamists today, you find a number of things. The first thing is that they are as alienated from what they see as traditional forms of Islam as they are from Western society. They are as cut off from traditional forms of, of, of Islam as they are from, from, from uh, Western society. And part of what impels them towards a fundamentalist view is precisely that they're cut off from their traditional, uh, those traditional institutions. Um, and so uh, their, their reading of religion uh, and, and they, they attempt to create some kind of relation between themselves and God um, can, does not take place within an institutional framework, but takes place within an individualised framework. And I want, what I'm suggesting is that that is something not peculiar to Islam or to religion, but it's something that's happened much in a much broader way across society. In a much broader way across society, um, uh, the social is fragmented and we've become much more individualised, atomised, and, and the fundamentalism is simply a reflection of those broader uh, changes in society. I think uh, we could easily um, go on for a few hours, the three of us, but I think um, at this point, when uh, the moment is approaching when we should um, adjourn and uh, proceed to the bottle, uh, we should throw it open and give people in the audience a chance to bombard us with questions, remarks. I still have a mic here to offer. I don't know how many people are here Muslims or uh, have any background about the, this culture and religion, but uh, I think uh, it's very important for Muslims because I am one Muslim. And uh, that they believe, um, that, uh, first of all, uh, Muslims believe is uh, very much personal. They have their uh, personal uh, uh, prayers and so it's uh, even if they don't go to the mosque or whatever they can do uh, practice their religion and also it's a, a very a deep belief of them that uh, if the world is not uh, um, it, yeah they should be it's uh, their belief that they should be trustful they, uh, they should be honest with each other and uh, always say the truth and uh, it's also a very personal thing to say the truth. And if you um, believe in something, you should always say your beliefs and uh, uh, do what you believe in. And it's a personal thing to do. It's not something that uh, someone should tell me what I should do. And, uh, so I think if I uh, feel that uh, some uh, political thing is going around, um, that is against me, I should freely say it and uh, defend uh, all my thoughts. So I think it is a very personal thing in Islam, that's uh, something that is constitutionalized by uh, anything else. And maybe it is the difference between Islam and other religions. So I don't know if uh, you see the opposition between the things that you said, what I said, but uh, I thought so. <laughs> Do you, do you think that um, this is a particularly uh,
contemporary um, attitude, this emphasis on the personal uh, that we've just heard? No, I mean, the point is that, you know, e even if you go back to um, pre-Protestant Catholicism, people would see their religion in, in a personal sense. That's not, I'm not saying people don't see them, their, their religion in a personal sense, because they would, because you, you always see yourself uh, as having a, an in the individual relationship to society, to, to institutions of society, and, and therefore to the beliefs of those institutions of society. But it was in a context, it was, it was, it was framed by what, uh, what, what those institutions and what those cultures and what those traditions uh, uh, told you and believed. What's happening now is that, is that there, there, there is a, um, I mean, I'm going to give practical examples, it's, it's much easier to do. Take, for instance, um, Mohammed Zadid Khan, the, 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 the man who, the leader of the, the London tube bombings. He grew up in, uh, in, in Leeds, in, in, in Northern England. Um, he uh, was, became estranged from his family because he wanted to marry uh, a woman from a, from a different uh, uh, clan, effectively. Um, being estranged from his family, he was cut off from his community, he was cut off from the institution, from, from the traditional, uh, from the mosque his family attended, and so on. He then developed, um, he, he, for a while he gave up religion altogether. When he came back to religion, he developed a much more intensely personal view um, of, 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 of what it meant to him, a much more literal reading of the Quran, a, a much more uh, 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 intensely uh, intense view of, of what, 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 how uh, uh, Muslims uh, uh, should behave, what they should wear, and so on. In other words, it's his uh, disengagement from those traditional institutions uh, that made him uh, push him in a certain direction. The question of the veil, for instance, is, is a very... The question of the veil has never been a big debate with Islam, as you know. Historically, it's never been a major, major issue. It's only become a major issue in recent years because it's become a, a symbol of uh, a, 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 a particular uh, 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 identity. Um, and it is in that context that the bell becomes uh, a symbol. So it is, it is, what I'm suggesting is that it is that estrangement from uh, traditional cultures and uh, institutions uh, that creates a more literal, uh, a more fundamentalist view, both of uh, the text of God and of the, the forms that one has to take in order to follow that religion. But how is that different, for example? I mean, the, well, for one thing, the veil. I mean, in the 1920s, I read in Egypt, it was a whole big issue um, about whether or not women should wear the veil, and there were big statements of women taking off the veil and so forth. But the more the, the, the key point about uh, being isolated, how is it different from, for example, the transcendentalists, right? In America, beginning of the 19th century, they go off, they live in farms, they think about free love. You know, they're not at all connected to church. Some of them are breaking with their families. I mean, this, this is what's happening. Yeah. I'm going to intervene here. I'd like to offer audience one more chance to hold on. Perhaps we go into that. But the questions around the notion of veil, that's the whole new set of debate we would open. Is there an urgent question in the audience? Um, uh, Ken, and thanks very much for a, a wonderful talk, actually, um, and a very clear and, I think, um, <coughs> correct diagnosis of the fact that religion is, is essentially a symptom rather than a cause, and I think we concentrate too much on religion. We tend to lose the underlying cause, which is this context that you've spoken about in its broadest sense. Um, I've just got one minor point, because I agree enormously with a lot of what you said. My minor point is your description of the political conditions after 1989. Because what you talked about there was the, in a sense, the, the end of politics, the death of politics, the, the reduction of politics to a managerial system. Um, and I'm not sure to what, to what extent that helps us or to what extent that's true. In other words, I think the politics, um, or I, I wonder how you see the politics of neoconservatism or neoliberalism playing in the post-1989 period. It seems to me that the politics which might be summed up by Fukuyama's end of history is an extremely strong political um, uh, act, an act of human agency. 
it's an act of will to naturalize economics as a political doctrine. And I think unless we can understand that move after 89 as a political move, as a move of human agency, then it's difficult for us to reintroduce, which is of course now urgently needed if we look from the economic troubles to the despair in Gaza, um, to, to reintroduce the political as an act of human agency into the discourse, which I think is what you're asking for ultimately. I would, I would imagine that the logic of your argument is uh, in that direction. Um, but it seems to me that, that, that as much as the return of religion might be a theme, the, the return of politics and other myths would, would be very much a myth. And a myth, myth, the idea that politics went away, is a myth which I think disables our thinking enormously uh, and has done over the last 20 years. Take 1989. 1989 was was was, a, was symbolic of, of, of a shift that was taking place. It, it was already taking place, mm -hmm. um, um, and you can see that in in, 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 in the 70s and 80s already. Um, the, the, the erosion of, of uh, belief in social transformation, in, of, of, of social action, of collective action. You know, nobody. You know, the, the very notion of collective action, which which once kind of held the left together, and that now seems. Um, there are very few people actually believe in that anymore, um, and so I think it seems to me 1989 was 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 a, was a, was was, was um, symbolic of a shift that was already taking place. You raised the question of Fukuyama. What was what's striking about Fukuyama in the end of the history thesis is how quickly the optimism, the uh, one that, that that kind of triumphalism of the end of the end of the history thesis drained away. Um, you know, by the mid 90s. Um, the idea that, uh, the, the, that people weren't talking anymore about the triumph of capitalism, but, but, but the problems created by the fragmentation and breakdown of societies and so on. And so uh, it, it, the, the most striking thing about that was, was how quickly that, that just eroded. Um, and so, uh, it, it, you know, in, in broad sense, the idea... There has been a shift, it seems to me, between what I call a politics of ideology and a politics of identity. That, that we no longer, that when we talk about politics, we no longer talk about in broad terms about the kind of visions of society we want, but about how to best manage the society we've got already. And the most striking expression of that see, it, was the response to the current financial crisis. I, mean, I, was, I, was, we were having, I was having a debate with, with Maria about this earlier. Which is that if you take the two, diff the two um, significant changes in economic zeitgeist in the 20th century, the 1930s and the 1980s, in both of them took place um, in, in the context of, uh, of, 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 a, uh, of a world where there was a, 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 an ideological and political alternative. In, 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 the, in, in the 20s and 30s, the uh, uh, crisis, uh, the crisis that, uh, that the Depression brought brought out, create, uh, took place in a context um, both of the existence of the Soviet Union and of uh, the, 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 the emergence of Kentonism as a viable alternative in, 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 in market economies. In the 1980s, the, um, the, the, the disenchantment of Kentonism brought neoliberal economic, neoliberal ideology to the fore. What has happened now is that you have a breakdown of, 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 of any kind of uh, faith in, 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 in the market, but nothing in, in an ideological uh, level to replace it. And, and that's what seems to me uh, the, the, the shift that's taken place. And I think that's a very significant shift because the whole context in which we talk uh, about what to do about this current crisis is very, very different from the context in which we talk about what to do with the crisis in the 80s or the crisis in, in, in the 30s. But you're right, I'm talking about politics in the sense rather than about religion, but, but that, that's the issue. Well, the well, well, absolutely. Um, I know, I, um, um, no, I think I'll... I'll no, I, I, I mean, I, th I think it's true, but I, but I, I think what, the, what is important is to understand, if we talk about the end of politics, and I think the end of history is an ideological statement, I, don't, I think the optimism might die, but its after effects have continued because what's happened is that neoliberalism and subsequently neoconservatism tried to national, naturalize the idea of ideology. 
trying to say that the, the, the capitalism, their system, their imposition, their vision of the world, because I think neoliberals do have a vision of the world. I think they do have a, an ideology which is connected to the free market, which is connected to exploitation of, of the resources of, of two-thirds of the world for the benefit of the one-third of the world, which is globalization. Now, I think that process is ideological. It's just that because there isn't another ideology opposed to it, it's exactly the, the sort of... Um, um, the, the, the necessarily by optics that you need in order to, to understand perspective. Yeah? If you take one eye away, you no longer can see perspectives. In that sense, the, 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 the loss of a counter-argument, of a set of counter-possibilities, rendered that ideology invisible for a period of time. And it's to reclaim the visibility of that ideology, and therefore maybe the agency, the political agency, to change it, that I think we're busy with doing, or hopefully we're busy with doing. But at the same time, I think you're right that the response to the, the crisis now is, is radically different from the 30s and 80s because of that ideological, uni-optical um, uni mode. And thanks very much, Dr. Mali, for a very illuminating paper. I was fascinated by um, the uh, formulation that faith is the religious wing of um, identity politics, which I agree with. Uh, partially. Um, my question has to do with the paradoxes of identity in this particular context of your paper. We could argue that identities have been under attack for a while. We could date it maybe since the 16th century, but okay, let's say since the 60s, as in 1960s. And that they have been weakened by a general condition, whether it's the condition of postmodernity or whatever. Uh, we could then go on to argue that because they have been weakened, they are in no position to sustain any serious religious process. It's quite the contrary. It's because they are weak that they're actually turning to religion to get extra vitamins for the soul or extra narcissistic input to find the robustness that they have lost. If that is the case, and it is a series of if that I'm putting to you, then the return of religion can only be the, re the return of this highly narcissistic, hyper-commodified, uh, sort of identity politics, as you put it. And if that is the case, then Richard Dawkins is writing saying that this return of this kind of religion, non-theistic and narcissistic, is a triumph for atheism. It spells the absolute death of the religious experience. It is, it is, it is the opposite of the religious experience. Would that tell me something that you can comment on? Um, I don't think it's, it's, it's a triumph of, 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 of atheism, but I think it's, it's a triumph, it, it, it's the erosion of faith or belief in a, in a broader sense. But it, it, part of what I'm trying to say is, is that the erosion of, of, of religious belief um, is part of the erosion of, of, of belief in, in a broader, because one can have belief in all sorts of things. I think it's important to have belief, to have faith, um, not necessarily um, religious faith, but religious belief. Um, and a world without belief of faith um, would be a, a would seems to me to be a, a, a terribly uh, awful disenchanted world. Um, it, it, the question is, what do you have faith in? What do you have belief in? Um, and part of the problem, it seems to me, is, is that it's the very notion of faith and belief um, that has become eroded, um, uh, and, and that the belief the erosion of religious faith is part of that broader erosion of, of faith and belief that we see taking place. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> thanks you all, the speakers, for a very, uh, yeah, for me personally, uh, interesting um, contributions. I will try to, to be kind of brief, though the issue I'm addressing is very complex, and I will start with the example that Mark Valenta gave. Um, Freddy the Frog Hits the Cross, I think that's the title of his work, and um, comparison to the video of the suicide bomb. And if I remember correctly, you said that there is a, some, some kind of a structural correspondence or similarity, the use of uh, collage, the kind of, uh, uh, yeah, we, you, you said narcissistic kind of affirmation of the, of, of the artist as a and um, and, in a, and I was struck by like such an affirmation of correspondence because one of the cases is, is uh, employs a, a very self-reflexive gesture, Freddie the Frog, uh, 
ironic and so on and so forth, while, while the other uh, uses a certain genre which is very affirmative, narcissistic and so on. So I would say um, in, they are actually fundamentally different um, because one of them employs the return, okay, the myth as a positive fiction, as, as something which is affirmed um, like a, an affirmation of an origin, and the other one uses that religious reference as a critical which actually is a very self-reflexive moment which, which does not affirm originality um, um, like the figure of an artist, genius, whatever, like at all. I mean, it, and, and, and this is particularly postmodernist gesture which opposed to the modernism that you were attacking on the terms of being, you know, narcissistic, egotistic and so on, actually is quite a different thing, but it resurrects the, the whatever makes the religious reference. There was uh, more a comment that do you want to react with Mark? Um, well, I agree and disagree. I mean, I, I see your point. One, one is art and the other one is a promotional material. I mean, it's as if you're comparing art and advertising. Um, at the same time, advertising can be very layered and complex uh, in terms of the kinds of resources that it's drawing on, the kinds of messages that it's generating, the ways in which it's creating its subject. Um, I think the, the uh, yeah when when I mean when I say that modernity sacralizes egotism, I don't mean that necessarily negatively. I just mean uh, more there's the, the sacralization of the individual and the creative and the centering on the self or on the human rather than on the divine and so forth. Um, but I think you know I mean the, the the idea that this video what you see is what you get. I don't think it's not put together in that way. There's a lot of uh, work that's done in order to construct the video in particular ways. And those ways are not all mutually reinforcing. Um, so it's not necessarily intended to create a postmodern effect. 